Uh, I'm very happy to be here today and thank you very much for, to Prof. Barber who has uh, asked me to give this talk. Uh, I actually belong to the Solar Fuels Lab, which is uh, advised by Prof. Barber and started by him in 2009. And much of the work that I'm going to present today is actually done by uh, my PhD students, Ying Fan, Guru, and Prince. Um, <clears throat> Most of the speakers in this conference, have, uh, in this workshop, have been talking about uh, natural photosynthesis. So I may be the only one who's not going to talk about photosystem too. And uh, what I'm trying to do in my lab, in my group, is trying to take uh, inspiration from what the leaves done so e efficiently in nature, and to make an artificial system with an ultimate goal to have an artificial leaf that we can actually just put in water irradiate with sun and generate oxygen and hydrogen. That's the ultimate goal, which probably will be my lifelong journey and lifelong mission. So, <clears throat> uh, one of the most uh, easy way to realize artificial <laughs> photosynthesis is by using a semiconductor system, okay, where we can actually absorb light and generate charge separation uh, similar to photosystem 2 and use the electron generated in the conduction band to reduce water and holes that is generated in the valence band to um, oxidize water. So when we look into a, a range of available semiconductor system, we can see that the ones that can perform both hydrogen and oxygen uh, generation at the same time usually must have a conduction band maximum higher than the water reduction level and valence band maximum which is lower than oxidation level. And most of these are um, actually titanium dioxide, which is the first semiconductor found to uh, show this effect by Fujishima and Honda, usually has a high band gap, which means they actually only um, absorb UV light efficiently and not much on the visible light. And most of the lower band gap semiconductor, which absorb efficiently in the visible light, they don't straddle these two oxidation and reduction level. Um, so in this case, many of us actually decided to work on either the semiconductor that generate oxygen or semiconductor that generate hydrogen in a simple photoelectrochemical system where the n-type semiconductor used to generate uh, oxygen is used as a photoanode and the p-type semiconductor to, which generate hydrogen is used as a photocathode. So in this talk, I will mainly discuss about two semiconductor systems. One is the hematite, which is used as a photoanode. And uh, towards the end, I will talk about uh, our P-type semiconductor, which is a castrite system used as a photocathode. And most of our group uh, objective is actually trying to match the time scale that James Duran has talked about just now, how we can match the uh, minority carrier lifetime in our semiconductor system with the oxidation, the time scale of the oxidation or reduction of water. And we do that by a lot of engineering, doping, surface modification, etc. So hematite, just a brief introduction of this material, has a nice band gap, 2.2 eV. So it has a, a reasonably good visible light absorption. It is stable in wide pH range because it is rust. So you cannot, uh, so it's already very stable in its form. It's abundant, cheap, and non-toxic. So among most of the metal oxide semiconductors um, studied as a photoanode, the highest theoretical conversion efficiency is achieved by iron oxide, just by looking at the band gap uh, energy. And titanium dioxide is actually not very high here. However, hematite has a lot of problems. Uh, the first problem is the low absorption coefficient. So we need to have at least 400 to 500 nanometer thick hematite to efficiently absorb light. But the minority carrier diffusion length is uh, very small, 2 to, point, 2 to 5 nanometer. Which means if we just make a thin film of hematite, only 2 to 5 nanometer uh, thickness can actually separate the charges efficiently. Otherwise, the recombination, the bulk recombination will dominate and we don't extract enough charges. So one clever way to um, overcome this problem is by doing nanostructuring. So we can still grow a nanostructure with uh, absorption depth 
similar to the uh, required ones for uh, light absorption, but we engineer the width to be in the order of the minority carrier diffusion length. So at the same time, we can absorb light and still have enough charge separation. Uh, however, when we do nanostructuring, there's another problem because of the high surface density. There's so much recombination on the surface and because of the already slow OER kinetics at the interface, this actually become the rate limiting step in the overall reaction. So there are various ways to tackle the limitation in hematite. So this is a typical uh, photocurrent voltage uh, that we observe in hematite. I think in the earlier talk, somebody asked about what is the voltage required to actually start generating oxygen in hematite. So typically, uh, it's between 0.8 to 1 volt versus RHE, depending on what kind of modifications you do to the materials. And the ultimate goal is actually try to increase the photocurrent as much as possible and reduce the overpotential as much as possible. Um, so Michael Gretzel started, the, uh, started to bring the attention back to this material when he reported the cauliflower structure of iron oxide. And this nanostructuring actually does indeed help to improve the photocurrent. And subsequently, uh, many bulk modification uh, strategies have been proposed, for example, by doping, uh, and then also surface overlayers to improve the kinetics at the interface. And then co-catalyst, um, many of um, mo one of the most successful one is cobalt phosphate, which is uh, uh, proposed by uh, Daniel Nocera, and recently is the nickel iron oxide based uh, um, co-catalyst. And of course, there's uh, people also can try to improve the charge separation by introducing an electric field generated by heterojunctions of two semiconductor materials. So these are some of the uh, uh, techniques that people use to. Uh, improve the performance of hematite. Now, in my group, I actually grow nanorods of uh, hematite on FTO using a hydrothermal method. And after, uh, we anneal this at various temperatures to, uh, to improve the um, crystallization and also to uh, generate some doping. Uh, what we learned from this very first experiment is when we annealed it at 650 degrees C, where there is a minimum thin diffusion from FTO, uh, and we illuminate uh, this structure from the front, we actually generate very little photocurrent. But when we illuminate from the back, we generate a quite significant photocurrent. So this means that the recombination in the bulk is actually limiting the performance of hematite because when you illuminate from the front, actually electron uh, does not sufficiently get extracted from FTO and recombine with the holes, so inhibiting the oxidation reaction. So because of that, we know that we need to dope the material to improve the bulk properties. And one of our early uh, uh, effort is to dope iron oxide with manganese. Of course, we have to do manganese because Prof. Baba is a very strong uh, advocate for manganese structure. So we have to do manganese. And uh, from material science perspective, this is also suitable for iron oxide because manganese and iron are just next to each other in the periodic table. So when we introduce manganese into iron oxide, we do not expect any structural uh, changes in iron oxide. So we do that, and we do manage to preserve the crystal structure of hematite, um, reasonable uh, absorption spectra, also there's not much change. And we do observe an improvement in photocurrent for manganese dope uh, iron oxide photoanodes. So we learn later on that uh, manganese, manganese doping actually increases the carrier concentration in iron oxide. And by UPS, we learned that the Fermi level of this manganese dope iron oxide actually gets closer to the, con to the conduction band, showing that this manganese actually acts as an electron donor. So it does improve the bulk properties of hematite. Now, we also observe from the chop photocurrent measurements that the transient current in manganese dope hematite is actually much better than the pristine hematite, which give us an idea that this manganese may also work as a catalyst. So I'll come back to this later on uh, in the next few slides. So we know that iron oxide, we need to improve the, uh, the, pro the quality of the surface in order to improve the kinetics at the interface. So we do this simply by spraying another layer of hematite on top of our nanorods 
and we actually managed to uh, preserve the nanorod structure. We just have a fatter nanorods, but we do see uh, a shell of a hematite, and we do observe an improved photocurrent and improved transient, which means that this core shell structure helps us to improve the uh, kinetics at the surface. Now, so now we, we use the intensity modulated photocurrent spectroscopy together with uh, uh, Pro and Fatwa at Hemholtz and Prof. Lori Peter from University of Bath to really understand the role of manganese and course, uh, the shell structure. What we find out is that uh, manganese actually increase the charge transfer rate constant which means that manganese actually is involved in improving the catalytic activity at the surface. And this is a little bit uh, unexpected because this is slightly different from what we intended to do at the beginning, but actually similar uh, observation has been observed when people dope hematite with tin. Separately has been found as well that there's a catalytic activities going on at the surface. And this may be also true because when we do uh, that profiling of seams, we found that manganese tend to segregate at the surface. So there's a manganese-rich surface on our nanorods. And then the core shell architecture itself seems to reduce the surface recombination rate constants, which indicate that uh, an additional layer of hematite actually pacifies the surface defects and enhance and reduce the recombination and enhance the whole extraction. So. Um, these are our main findings for hematite. And separately, after we report this uh, uh, core shell architecture, another group in Boston College, Dunwei Wang, also reported a hematite regrowth strategy. And by doing this, they actually improve the onset potential and adding it with the new uh, co-catalyst, nickel iron oxide, they actually moved the onset potential to 0.4. So this is pretty outstanding for hematite. So we are not alone in discovering that just by pacifying the surface with another layer of hematite actually does improve the surface pacification uh, property. So we move on uh, later on. I think uh, later maybe Prof. Baba will talk about this. So basically we just uh, um, make an unassisted water splitting by combining our hematite photo anode with a perovskite solar cell to apply the external bias needed to drive the water oxidation reaction. So this is one of the work that we have done. We tandem, uh, we put the hematite in front of a perovskite and we generate about 2.4% per, uh, solar to hydrogen efficiency. Um, we have also managed to done some scaling up work for hematite photoanodes. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, postdoc now has moved on to Hemholtz Berlin, so this work has been stopped for a while. But we do manage to uh, scale this up. And so as a, as a, a summary for hematite, uh, this is the evolution of uh, hematite from 1980s to uh, currently, right? So there is a, a quite a stagnant development for 20, 30 years. And then suddenly there's a surge after the discovery of the nanostructuring. And currently, I think the best efficient, the best uh, photocurrent is obtained at 6 milliamp per cm square, which is 50% from the theoretical limit. So there's still a lot of room for improvement. And for this, I uh, just want to spend some time to talk about this. This is done by a combination of nanostructuring, hydrogen treatment to improve the uh, bulk transport properties, titanium oxide overlayer to improve the, to reduce the uh, recombination on the surface, and also using a cobalt phosphate catalyst. So I guess the key to further push the photocurrent of uh, hematite is really to combine all these techniques together. So um, inspired by hematite, one of my PhD students actually worked on a novel iron oxide-based material, uh, which is an iron titanate. So the motivation is when we, when we started this, this uh, band diagram is not available. But the idea is, can we actually mix, uh, make a, a compound, new compound, compound, iron titanate, with a similar property as iron oxide, but probably a slightly higher conduction band, mani minimum, compared to hematite. Um, and iron titanate has been reported for different types of application, but not in photocatalysis or not in water splitting. So at that time, uh, we do not know what is the band levels, 
uh, we do not, and one of the challenges is to make a phase pure iron titanate, and we do not know anything about the charge transport properties. So my student take on this uh, uh, ambitious project, and he does manage to make a single phase iron titanate tin film using hydrothermal methods. Uh, and, we, and he managed to make a, a decent photo anodes based on this, and after surface modification uh, with tin oxide, managed to improve the photo current as well. And we move on to measure the band energetics of this iron titanate, and found that the conduction band minimum of this material is indeed slightly higher than iron oxide, and slightly higher than water uh, reduction level. So after we... Uh, after we report this uh, band structure, another independent uh, work is actually reported which validate our, the, the position of this uh, uh, energy levels, which uh, we are quite happy about. And after that, um, there's another interesting work which actually combine titanium dioxide nanotube with iron titanate as the shell structure. And using this combination, they managed to have 4.1 milliamp per cm square. And this is amazing because titanium oxide itself, the highest photocarbon possible is only 2 milliamp, which means the additional 2 milliamp is supplied by iron titanate. So this is really a very encouraging work uh, that validates our intuition towards this uh, iron titanate materials. So um, now I will shift a little bit to the photocathode system. So this is the p-type semiconductor which we use to generate hydrogen. Uh, I have a group of students and postdocs who, who are working on this material, CZTS, as a solar cell material. And we look at the uh, pro properties of this material and found that this is also suitable for photocathode because the uh, energetic band alignment, is uh, the valence band minimum is actually higher than water reduction potential. Uh, it has a good absorption coefficient, it's earth abundant, and if you look at the prediction here, given the band gap of 1.5 uh, EV, the STH efficiency can reach more than 30%. So this is a, 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 a very interesting material to look at as photocathode. Now, however, um, from the few reported data in literature on this material, uh, the photocurrent is actually less than half or even less than one-third of the theoretical uh, photocurrent predicted. And the onset potential is quite poor. And one of the biggest problems here is the stability. It has a poor stability in aqueous environment. So some of the earlier work on this material as photocathode usually use uh, N-type material, either cadmium sulfide, indium sulfide, or zinc sulfide, uh, to generate charge separation at the interface. And then they put another coating layer of oxide to improve the uh, stability in aqueous environment. Um, so there are several reports on this. But actually one of the biggest problems of CZTS is in the bulk properties. Because CZTS consists of copper, zinc, tin, sulfide. And copper and zinc has very similar uh, cation sizes. And because of this, they tend to exchange with each other very easily to form a copper zinc antisite, which causes disorder in this structure. And, this, and the real reason behind uh, this is actually still unknown, but uh, people associate the presence of copper zinc antisites or this disorder with a high recombination rates in the bulk, which translate to a low minority carrier lifetime. Now, when I say low minority carrier lifetime, actually this is in the nanosecond. So this is still much better than a uh, hematite, all right? But in photovoltaic, this is considered low. So, um, so in order to uh, overcome this problem, people try to replace zinc with different metals, which is slightly bigger or smaller than copper to, re to reduce the uh, possibility of forming these copper zinc antisites. So some people reported germanium, uh, uh, substitution or barium substitution uh, in order to improve the photocurrent. Now, in our group, we replace zinc with cadmium. And in my solar cell group, we managed to make a, a good solar cell based on this with an efficiency up to 11%. And 
And so we think, why not we use this material as a photocathode? And we do that, and we collaborate with Domain Group from University of Tokyo. So uh, uh, Professor Domain's group has, been, uh, has reported a very effective coating layer of titanium moly to protect the uh, CZTS or CIGS uh, photocathode. So we collaborate with them, and we managed to show a, a very nice photocurrent using CCCTS, CDS, and titanium moly combination. Uh, photocurrent at zero volt is around 17 milliamp, and so far this is the highest reported for castrite system in the world. Um, and then we also observe a half cell solar to hydrogen efficiency of 4%. Um, and then uh, we also notice that the hydrogen produced is close to unity, so this is very nice. And there is a slight degradation of current density over time, but we attribute this to the um, delamination of platinum because when we redeposit platinum, actually the photocurrent goes back to its original value. So we again we try to understand why CCCTS uh, has performed so well as a photocathode. So we did some uh, 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 charge carrier measurement with our collaborator in the physics department. We found out that uh, uh, in the CZTS without cadmium, uh, the ca the, there's a little fluence dependence on CZTS, which means that the, uh, there is a, a lot of trapping and surface recombination happening on the material itself. But when we use cadmium, actually there is a fluence dependence, which shows that when we use cadmium, we actually have a, a lot more free carriers and less recombination. And this combined with the, our whole mobility measurement that shows that cadmium actually uh, uh, improve whole mobility and reduce carrier concentration, shows that this cadmium doping actually increases carrier transport by increasing carrier mobility, reducing the carrier concentration, and therefore increasing the charge separation, the depletion width at the uh, hetero junction. And all of this together improve our photocurrent. So with that, I'd like to conclude. Um, I think the key for uh, generating artificial photosynthesis is really the finding the right semiconductor to work on. Currently, all the known semiconductor is not perfect. So novel materials, novel oxides, novel vanadates, or novel castorides are needed. Uh, and then we also need to uh, help the charge separation by using a hetero junction, doping, uh, and also to improve the catalytic activities using the right co-catalyst. So finding the right co-catalyst is also a very big uh, uh, motivation in our work. So I'd like to end by thanking my PhD students, Guru, Prince, and Ying Fan, uh, and also Prof. Baba. This is the photo taken at the symposium last summer when he was granted the honorary degree from NTU. And last but not least, to Prof. Anderson, for kindly supporting our lab. So this is a photo taken when he received the uh, President Technology Award from the President of Singapore, among many awards that he has won during his tenure here. Uh, this is one that is actually, uh, this is the highest award that is given by the President of Singapore. So uh, these are some of his uh, 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 most uh, uh, common photo. This is the one that you probably want to see. Uh, scooting into Nanyang Auditorium and this. So, of course, he will be missed by NTU and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, Lydia, I, I was interested in that um, titanium iron o o o oxide system. <laughs> your measurement of Fermi levels suggested it, it, it wasn't very n-type. Mm. Is that right? Yes, it's but it is n-type. But, 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 but it looked like it was much less n-type yes. for titanium and hematite. Yes, yes. 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 Does, does that change how it works? So actually we do find that the carrier concentration is less than iron oxide. So the bug properties is actually worse than iron oxide. Uh, we did not publish that yet. Uh, this is still ongoing. But we found that the surface properties is better. 
So we actually have another publication where we use iron titanate as a coating on iron oxide. And it, I think it's because of the energetic at the hetero junction, it improves charge separation. Yeah. Closing questions. Uh, I can do, well, we're finishing with this, but uh, Lily, I, I actually, uh, you know, you showed the, the theoretical curve of the maximum efficiency we could possibly get from hematite if we can just get everything right. Uh, you showed the curve, but you didn't say the actual current, the maximum currents. Uh, you thought you did probably, but you didn't. What is it again? 12, 12 milliamps. 12 milliamps, yes. isn't it? And so uh, what is the maximum we got in the world at the moment? Four or something like that? Six. Six? Six. Six. So we are getting closer. Oh, so six. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. It's that... recent. It's just published last year, I think. Oh, it's who was Korean that by? Group. It's a Korean group. Oh, the Korean group. Yes. Should have been us. <laughs> <laughs> Six, that's pretty good, that's really good. Anyway, if we can get to 12, it's pretty high efficiency, you know. Great. And what is marvelous, I think, about hematite uh, if, is that it, it, we've got tons of it on the planet. Yes, yes, and if we're going to come up with a technology which is massive, massive, then uh, this, is, this would be the wonderful way to go, non-toxic. And how many hours of illumination does it stand? Actually, it's very long. Actually, we didn't. Actually, this is very stable. We actually didn't really. What is, what is the end of stability or the yeah. self poisoning or whatever? <laughs> Hours, months. Months. Oh, yeah. Actually, okay. yeah. Okay. Sounds very stable. Yes. Yeah. They they didn't use nano rods today. The Korean group or, or they use. They do. They do. Oh, they do. Okay, good. So all of the nice work recently, they must use nano structuring. Nano structures, but nano rods. Nanorods, nan yeah, mostly nanorods, mostly nanorods. Uh, We're very proud here that we, uh, uh, Lydia, started nanorods. Congratulations. Okay, we move on to the, ah, ah. another question. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, a, a simple comment or a question. It's uh, uh, just from your, just a photo of a uh, 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 photo anode. I find actually it's uh, thickness is very thick. So that's why you need to illuminate from the back side. Actually, if you make it uh, a little bit thinner, I think it gets uh, better photo current, even from the front. So yes. have you tried that uh, because, uh, because you, uh, of your, your method or it's uh, optimized uh, condition or you do need this, this kind of thickness? We, we because I, I have the sample from EPFL from Micro growth uh, group, their film is really thin film. Yeah, yeah. So. We actually try the combination of different thickness, and we do op uh, optimize it to get our photocurrent. I think in the lab we have around uh, three to four milliamp photocurrent. Mm -hmm. So we are not doing too badly compared to the best in the world. Yeah. So if you make it a little bit thinner, maybe yeah, you also yeah. can reach that level. Yes. Yes. And yeah. But of course, uh, when we are thin, <laughs> then uh, you lose a little bit of absorption. So there is a balance there between absorption and efficient charge separation. Okay. And, and another small comment is uh, uh, you saw the uh, uh, scheme to show the plain uh, hematite photoanode, and another is called it nanostructure. But to me. In my opinion, I think it's even difficult to make a real plan uh, photo, uh, hematite photoanode because it's generated from the IOOH. It's uh, filled with a lot of water and the OH group, and you need to annihilate over, over, I think, 600 degrees. You remove a lot of OH group and the water group in the structure. It must be formed, the nanostructure. <laughs> Definitely, if uh, well design the nano rule that's better, but I don't believe it can make a real plan hematite. Actually, a nano, nano porous thin film will be nice. Yeah. Actually. 